Here's something that most of you that grew up in the 1970s will remember. This is a Packard Bell AM FM stereo receiver with a built in 8 track tape player. This is an 8 track tape for those of you who may not be familiar with the format. This receiver also has inputs for a turntable and an auxiliary input that can be used with a modern CD player, cassette player, etc. as well as tape output jacks for recording onto a cassette tape or reel-to-reel, -reel, etc. Models like this were sold under many different brand names throughout the late 60s, 70s, and early 80s. In fact, this model is not a true Packard Bell built unit. This was actually a Japanese built model that was made for Packard Bell. In fact, I was looking on eBay the other day and, and saw an identical looking Lloyd's stereo. Okay, let's turn this on and see what happens. And by the way, I got this from a TV shop. It was just sitting on a shelf in a back room. Apparently someone brought it in for repair and declined the repair charges and it just sat. So let's turn it on and see what happens. As you can hear, we have some bad filter capacitor hum, but other than that, we have audio on both channels. See what's on AM. trash programming. Okay, let's see what the 8-track tape does. Whoops, I keep forgetting. Most of these have a spring-loaded door. This one doesn't. In order to insert the tape, you have to press the door down. hear a little bit of audio with the volume cranked up. And apparently the track change mechanism is very touchy. This has controls for the track selector for the 8-track power, volume, balance, bass, treble, loudness, contour, and our function selector. This thing most likely has bad electrolytic capacitors in the power supply that's causing the hum that you hear, so let's open this up and see if we can do something with it. Okay, here we are disassembled. I still haven't figured out who actually made this thing for Packard Bell. It has a mixture of Matt Schuster, Nichicon, and Hitachi components inside. And here are our electrolytic capacitors here. There, 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 there. That little green one's a little bulged up there. So is that one here and here's our main filter capacitor that's most likely causing our hum problem. Technically every one of these electrolytic capacitors need to be replaced but we don't have time for that today so we're just gonna 
do basic service to try to get rid of the hum problem. Here's our 8-track deck. And one interesting thing that I noticed is that this 8-track tape player uses an AC motor, which is really the best type. The later models with DC motors tended to wear out quicker. And this this particular motor even uses a capacitor, a start capacitor, which is very strange on a 8-track tape player. And there's the underside showing the printed circuit boards, the underside of the circuit boards. I'd say this thing was probably made no later than about 70 or 71. It could even be a 69 model, but... I'm going to say, given the way this is constructed, and the fact that here on the dial that they use MC and KC instead of megahertz and kilohertz, that tells me that this is probably no newer than the very early 70s. So, with that said, let me do a little troubleshooting on this and see if I can get rid of the hum. Okay, I've located the problem. This big blue capacitor right here is the culprit. I will demonstrate. Okay, you hear the hum. Here's my test capacitor. Hum goes away. So I will take my soldering iron, desolder this old part, and put another one. Okay, here's our bad capacitor, a Nichicon brand, 1000 microfarad, 25 volt. And I found a date code on this capacitor of 6923, so we're going to say this thing was, this stereo was either made in 1969 or possibly early 1970, but at any rate, it's a very early uh, eight track and radio combination. So let me dig through my junk, see if I can find a suitable capacitor for this. Okay, we replaced the capacitor with one that I salvaged out of an old junk TV chassis. And since the old part was so much bigger with wider lead spacing, I had to solder some extra leads to the donor capacitor in order to install it. And we were able to get rid of the hum, but now we have another problem. As you can hear, the hum has virtually gone away. One channel works okay. The other channel is weak and distorted. And I suspect the problem is most likely one of these other capacitors here on this audio board and some of them do look a little bulged. Actually what needs to happen is this whole audio board needs to be recapped or actually the whole receiver needs to be recapped. That's the only way that this thing can be expected to uh, run reliably for many years to come. And unfortunately that operation is going to have to wait until another day. We don't have time for that now but you get the idea. Most of this old vintage equipment, even the early solid state stuff, will need a, a complete recap, especially all the electrolytic capacitors changed in order for it to work properly. So, so there you go. Thanks for watching and more to come later. You might see this thing working properly one day. Okay, here it is all put back together. I have done nothing else to this yet. The condition seems to have gotten a little better after it's played a while, which leads me more to believe that those other capacitors need to be replaced, but I'm not going to do that right now. I'm going to get a schematic for this, and I'll order all the capacitors I need for this, and and then redo it once I get all the parts. You can still hear a little popping and static in the right channel, which that could be a capacitor or a, or a noisy transistor. That's the right channel. That's the 
Uplift channel. Already done. Late in the game. I think Wes Golson got now see. I'm on track, so I'm in the rap bass. I'm gonna break it down so you can get a little deeper. Playing on that brand, I'm like a grim reverb. And to think that kind of crap passes for music these days. Light off. Give AM a try. And I misspoke earlier. This set does not actually have a line in or auxiliary input. It just has a phonograph input, which could also be used for an auxiliary input, but it does have a tape output jack. Yeah. And he's not, look, I think there's people. 100 items for a dollar or less every day. What road? got pushed on the airline website for baggage departments. Not success, but it's comfortable. Oh, and for all the atheists out there to say, oh, he's talking about religion, I can't pay attention. Because what? When you hear religion or you hear God or you see a crucifix, you know, you're offended. I have this note to atheist. When I see nothing, I think of you. Okay? So we're even. There you go. All right. Now let's talk about this soul. No. I think that's WDIA out of Memphis. One of the few music stations that I can get on AM anymore. I remember that song very well whenever I was in about the first grade. I actually had the album on cassette tape and then later I acquired it on a LP and I still have it. Where you'll always find a great pro Once again, more crap passing for music. But anyway, there you go. My 1969-1970 Packard Bell 8-track stereo still needs some work, but making progress. Thanks for watching, and more to come later. Okay, here's one you don't hear on the radio much. Uh, Three Roses by America. In fact, I don't recall a time I've ever heard that song on the radio. That was off of their first album. But that particular radio station is a college radio station that's ran by the local community college. They play light hits and oldies. And they play a much better variety than the big boy commercial stations do. The ones owned by the big conglomerate chains. Okay, I thought you'd enjoy that. So I'm really gone this time. More to come later.